connections and cables and things all work. Hey. Okay. So thank you. I hope you've all had a little bit of a chat. Um, our next speaker tonight is Richard. Uh, Richard was the UX lead at Previous Next, and he gave this awesome talk. The role of microcopy in user experience at UX as well. Don't build the hype too much, man. Uh, it was an amazing talk. So good. I hope it's as good tonight. As if it's not My good. head is still spinning. It's, yeah, it was incredible. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a really good talk and it's a really important piece because it's often something that gets you got. And it's a really important topic to talk about. So it's exciting to have Richard talking to us about it tonight. So we can all go. Go, go, go. Nice. Uh, hi, everyone. There are actually a lot more of you than I thought there'd be, but welcome. Uh, yeah, so I did this talk about a month ago at UX Australia, first time speaking, first time attending, actually. And that was a crazy experience, in a good way. I had a great time. Um, there was that constant feeling of being crushed by my imposter syndrome, but other than that, I was, <laughs> had a great time. Really rewarding. So anyway, Let's get started. So, I'm Richard, I'm the UX lead at an agency called Previous Next, and microcopy is a topic I really like to talk about. So, I'll just sign up for random product and services just to see what type of words they use, that sort of thing. That's kind of how the blog started, actually. And if you're not sure what microcopy is, that's completely fine. We'll cover that shortly, along with a bunch of other things. So, here's the classic overview slide. We'll be going over what microcopy is, uh, what it can be used for, the importance of choosing the right words, and there's going to be a bunch of examples throughout as well, so it's going to be great. Let's jump in. What microcopy? So in design circles, it's really popular at the moment. It's all over the blogs, medium and vision especially. But while it's a bit of a buzzword, a buzzword at the moment, microcopy itself has been around for a while and you're probably more familiar than you realise because it's there to download something and when you shut down your computer even when you log into Facebook oh, what's wrong with my screen? that didn't happen um, error messages, button labels, form field placeholders pop-ups, notifications all over the notifications you swap away, it is a heap coming back <laughs> <laughs> So the words and messages that help you around products and websites, that's microcopy. It's not always out being small and subtle though. So let's look at an example. This in screen. When you send an email, you just need to know that it was sent. This example from Spark's a pretty common approach for email clients. You send an email, the message pops in, and it just disappears like that. Simple and subtle. It's just an email and it happens all the time, so you don't really need to celebrate something like that. But sending out a campaign out campaign on MailChimp, that's a bigger deal. There's more weight and intention behind a decision like that, so it deserves a pat on the back. Or in their case, on a fight. You have to pick what's appropriate, basically. Often you are just giving some information, getting out of the way. But it's not always about speed either. Sometimes you need someone to slow down and pay attention. And microcop is really effective at adding just the right amount of friction. <coughs> so this is a product called Abstract, a service which allows design teams using Sketch to work with the same design files. Projects live online, not your computer, so if your computer blows up, you don't lose everything, which is fantastic. There are some actions, like deleting a project, where they need to make sure they've got the user's full attention. Deleting a project isn't like deleting an email, so you need to understand the weight of the decision and the consequences. So let's look a little bit closer. What's good about that description is it's um, very clear and concise. They front-loaded the critical information, like permanently delete, to make sure that's what's read first. And the form and button labels, well, because they're so clearly spelled out, it's hard to misinterpret anything that's going on there. So that makes the decision making process very intentional. You basically know what you're reading for, so that's, you know, that's all good. Earlier I mentioned that microcopy helps you navigate around products and websites. Let's unpack what that means a little bit. When I talk about what microcopy brings to user experience, I often reference these two themes. 
providing context and setting expectations. Providing context is about providing just enough information about what's relevant right now. Setting expectations is about letting users know what will happen next. Critical tasks like a deleting project example often come with increased anxiety. And like we saw, the right sentence can make all the difference. I sort of look at it like this. The more someone knows about what's happening now and what will happen next, the more confident they are about the decisions they're making. And users just need a little bit of momentum. They don't need to know everything. So take Siri, for example. With new technology, you need to establish the ground rules. In Siri's case, you need to know what you can ask and what you can expect in return. So they do something like this. And that's a great start because it gives you a better understanding of the possibilities. Quickly understand you can do things like call people, launch apps, and be a little bit casual with your language. All they're really doing is giving users a running start, um, providing some examples and letting them figure out the rest. But an important thing to point out is this. What you choose to say plays a big role because it influences the decisions that follow. Yeah, so when you're writing micro copy, a lot of it does come down to just choosing the right words. That means you're often choosing what to say and how to say it, but most importantly, how you're framing it and how things are framed can make a huge difference. Let's take pricing, for example. See, I'm seeing something like this all the time and it's honestly getting pretty annoying. Monthly prices for a product that build once a year. Because at a glance, both of them look like they're charged monthly, but really only Spotify is. If you look closely at Figma, that price isn't actually their monthly price, it's their annual price divided by 12. Their monthly price is just sneakily below. Um, Figma is an awesome product, so that's not a dig at them, but because they're not alone, like everyone's doing it. It's become this type of standard just to be competitive. And personally, I'd like to see more examples like this. Clear monthly pricing, clear annual pricing, including what you say. Most importantly, I know what my choices are. And users really should know what their choices are, because when they don't, then we're probably looking at something called a dark pattern. So a dark pattern is when a user is tricked into doing something, basically. One of the most common examples is called the bait and switch. It's when the user expects one thing but gets something else. Typically, when you have a checkbox, that means you're opting into something. This is being carefully worded to make you believe you are, but it's actually the opposite. What's worse at the second checkbox is what is an opt-in, making the UI more confusing, which is another dark pattern in itself. And that's pretty dodgy. And what's worse is um, bigger companies are guilty of this behavior as well. I know we just sung our praises about Evernote, so forgive me. <laughs> but recently I unsubscribed from a paid Evernote account, and this is what that process is like. So I started my journey from the accounts page, and then halfway down the page, I found the managed subscription. It's a bit hidden, but not that bad. This is where it gets tricky. So up top, the information is pretty helpful, but there's no button to cancel or anything. Not even a sneaky hyperlink, I really look for one. Looking down the page, I've found a summary of the pricing tiers and a bunch of buttons. Given I'm trying to cancel my subscription, nothing really felt that obvious. The most relevant was the maybe update subscription because cancelling is sort of updating in a way if you look at it. So let's try that. And then we land on this, a payment form. It's not what I needed. I didn't want to change my payment details or the billing frequency. This I actually thought was a link to cancel, but it's actually just text telling me that I can cancel any time, which is a bit all right. <laughs> um, so I did that process twice, and then I did this. And you shouldn't ever have to Google your way out of time. What was the answer? On this page, right at the bottom, that guy. So just to explain, to cancel my subscription, I had to change my account to the free one. And that's very misleading. Because while they might have the same effect, they're far from the same action. 
So let's keep going. Down right into basic. At least it looks like we're in the right place. It's a bit passive aggressive, but at least we're in the right place. <laughs> um, there is a clear hitter at the top, a warning message, and a big green button. What do you think that button says though? Proceed to downgrade, cancel subscription. Nope, it's a true. Um, that's the bait and switch basically, and that cancels the process, so you've got to start it all over again. <laughs> Keep going, and this section looks so bad. It's actually pretty helpful because it gives you an overview of what will change after the downgrade. So it's, that was the one good bit. Um, these buttons were again pretty annoying because again the primary button cancels the process and the secondary button, although it's labeled clearly, it's the secondary button. So let's keep going. Because obviously I pressed the one on the right. And <laughs> this page is almost perfect. Like the title is clear, the supporting copy lets me know when I'll stop charging my card. And the buttons, most importantly, are labeled clearly and the hierarchy is clear enough. On the right is a last ditch effort at customer attention, and I'm completely fine with those as long as they don't get in the way and it's out of the way. That's fine. And that was that process. It really shouldn't be that hard to get out of anything. Because at the end of the day, microcopy is just a tool to enhance user experience. So if it was designed specifically to confuse users, microcopy will make that experience just more confusing. So, as design teams creating these flows, we have this opportunity to influence user decisions. And while there may be important business goals, like customer attention, we need to make sure that we're still acting responsibly on behalf of our users, because stuff like that isn't okay. If someone wants to unsubscribe or get out of something, just let them and do it in good terms. They're more likely to come back that way. What we should be aiming for is mock copy that helps users when it matters. <laughs> um, you're probably all aware of Slack. One thing I really admire about how they use Microcopy <coughs> is their ability to provide the right information at the right time. Small things like showing text for any shortcuts when you start typing, letting you know messages can't be sent while you're offline, and showing an old channel name that's since been renamed. That's a good one. Quite achievers like this are really effective because they're timely and relevant, and that's what Microcopy is really great at. Come up to a close now, and we have covered a lot. We've gone over what micro, how Microcopy is everywhere, how establishing, establishing context and setting expectations leads to confident actions, and how we need to choose our words carefully. Most importantly, we've also touched on how microcopy can influence decisions, good and bad. So if you take one thing away from this talk, make it this. Be responsible. Because at the end of the day, users expect you're acting in their best interest. So don't betray their trust by tricking them into making choices they're not even aware of. And that's about it, really. If you have any questions or feedback, we might have time for you. He's got a question, this guy. Um, yeah, so, what's, yes, ask away questions. First of all, thank, thank you so much. That, that experience of unsubscribing is not just... It's not good. It finds it, I don't know, it's actually a lot of problems to that. Yeah, um, what is it? Adobe's is pretty bad. Like, Freddy Card's pretty bad. Adobe, oh my god. Pretty bad. Yeah. Go Adobe's through. lovely if we're on camera now. Yeah, no. <laughs> so, that, that happens a lot. Um, all those companies have direct designers, but why does that happen? Why does it happen? Oh. Um, that's a pretty good question. It's not just about microcopy, just to, like, that's, um, yeah, microcopy's not going to fix the, fix the problem. It's definitely an organisational thing. If you've got different areas of the business with the wrong priorities in mind, or with priorities that aren't going to benefit the user, stuff like that happens. Like when they heavily load customer attention and they don't really care about the ways to go about doing it, you're going to come up with an, or end up with an experience that's really working against people trying to get out. And it's like, yeah, it took me a little bit of effort to get out of it, but 
I'm pretty good at creating as well. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a question actually. How do you how do you convince stakeholders of the importance of micro credit? <sighs> it's kind of one of those things where it depends on the person you're speaking to, and depends on like what we're talking about as the as the thing, like. Microcopy is a very tactical kind of a thing. Like you're talking about the words and how they're presented, and it's kind of like um, if we're talking about the value of a certain step, and we know from user experience that they're really struggling to understand the concept of something, or they're anxious about something, like they're worried that what you're going to do with their data, and you sort of then you present something that's going to put that you know anxiety at ease. Um, if they're worried about how much shipping is going to cost, and you kind of like say, well, shipping is free, oh, I didn't have that, and cool, anxiety gone. So it really depends on the problem you're trying to tackle, but um, a lot of the times the discussion about microcopy is several steps down the line. Um, yeah, kind of. And I say it depends without being a copy.